Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. And I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard Version. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Verse 15. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the full knowledge of him, so that you, the eyes of your heart, having been enlightened, will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of the might of his strength, which he worked in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all of rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. True worship is to look on to Jesus Christ, our Lord. And when so many things are happening around us, it's easy to be distracted and look at other things and other people. But the Bible exhorts us to look on to Jesus Christ, our Lord, the author and finisher of our faith in Hebrews. And it is now a time for us to look up to Him. And that is the very reason why we have come together this morning to listen to him and to learn from him and also to praise and glory, give all glories to him. We return to Ephesians chapter 1 now. We went to chapter 5 last week and looked at the passage um, and learned much from that passage about church and what it means to be a member of God's church. But we actually started in Ephesians chapter 1 and um, sort of took a pause in verse 14. And we had the Bible seminar, evangelistic seminar um, as well. And we returned to verse 15 today and all the way to the end of the chapter, uh, verse 23. Now, before we begin, let's um, think about this question. It's a question about prayer because this passage is about Paul's prayer for the church. So can I ask you... When was the last time you prayed for the church? Maybe this morning. It may be that you pray for the church every day. But when was the last time you prayed for the church? And we often pray for us. We pray for each other. We ask prayer points uh, from other people. Can you please, please pray for me and pray for my family? Um, and we even ask questions like, you know, what can I pray for you? Yes, we do pray for each other. We pray for one another. And that's good. But have you prayed for the church as a whole? Now, we are all part of the church, and we are actually the church, but have you prayed for the church? Church is ministry. Church is future. Uh, church is, uh, you can say, well-being. Um, church is effectiveness. Anything that may be lacking in the church, or anything that we can give praise to God, for what God is doing in our church. And if you have prayed for the church, what did you pray for? Or how did you pray? Now, if you feel slightly guilty on that question, well, you, know, you might like to pray more for the church. And if you feel, yes, I am praying for the church, I ask you to continue on with that and pray all the more fervently for the church. 
one common, um, you might say, era or tendency in a church that stresses the importance of Bible study, like our church, is that we can easily neglect the need and importance of prayer. Sometimes churches that are a bit more sort of, you know, charismatic in their nature, they tend to pray more. Whether that prayer is genuine or not is another question, but they do tend to pray more, I guess, than studying the scripture. But for churches that study the scripture fervently, they can tend to neglect the duty of prayer. But we know that the two must go together. Even as this morning uh, in our men's devotion time, we talked about that. And if you miss prayer, if you don't pray and just grow in knowledge, then that knowledge will puff you up. That knowledge will make you proud. And that knowledge will, in fact, um, allow and, and even cause your love to grow cold, which is exactly what happened to the church in Ephesus. The Ephesian church started well, but in Revelation chapter 2, the Lord Jesus said, I have this one thing against you, and that is you have left your first love. So we talked about how we can then guard ourselves against that. And it is simply to be fervent in our prayers. So when was the last time you prayed for the church? And what did you pray for? How did you pray? Did you really pray from your heart, fervently and passionately and earnestly to the Lord of church, the things that are needed for the church, for specifically and particularly for our church. I feel that we have not prayed for our church as much as, as we should, should and should have. So we will take some time during the table talk today. We've discussed that, I've discussed it with um, Ron, um, and we'll actually spend some time to pray to help you and to prompt you to pray for the church in your own time as well. In fact, we will even set aside some time to pray for the church every time we have a time and opportunity to pray together in corporate prayer. Let's see the example of Paul's prayer here. And we can learn a few things about what we can pray and how we can pray for the church from this text in fact, this is an excellent example of anyone's prayer, especially a minister's prayer, pastor's prayer for the church. It is lengthy, yes, but we can actually break it down and look at the details, and I'm sure you can be enriched so greatly. In fact, Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3, the three chapters that are all very doctrinal, are full of amazing truth that requires hard work. It's almost like uh, treasure hunting, or it's almost like gardening, or you might even say it's almost like diving. If you have to go into the depth of the ocean to harvest the seafood that you need to get. It's almost like working so hard for the whole year, digging the ground and working on the plants so that you might have some fruit at the end of the, the harvest season. It's almost like going into the treasure hunt, sometimes even risking your life and investing all that you have to just find that treasure that you're after. Unless you do the work, the hard work of reading and wrestling with the texts, you will not get the benefits of this text. And I do really hope that this morning will be uh, just a little bit of um, encouragement for you to go and do that. I can help you do that, um, as I have already done with the text, but I would like you to do the same. Go back and read it ten times, hundred times if you have to, and go and read it in little parts and break into different phrases and think about each meaning, the meaning of each phrases, and now then bring them all together to actually multiply and magnify the benefits of understanding the whole text. And I'll do that with you this morning a little bit, um, as much as time allows. We cannot expect to do all of that in you know, 40 to 50 minutes, but I ask you to do that in your time. And if you do that, you don't need any anything else. You might need some study Bible or commentary that will help you, but you really need the scripture. Just take the Bible and take the time and read without this distraction. And give yourself enough time, not just like 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, but give yourself some bulk of time on an hour or two at a time and just read this text, chapter 1, and even our text from verse 15 to 23, 
and try to understand what the Lord is trying to uncover for you. And only then will you, uh, you know, be able to benefit from um, the text and, and have the dividends of that hard work and understanding. So keep that in mind. And let's have a look at this excellent example of Paul's prayer for the church. Now the main verb is simply found in verse 16. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers. So the key word is this, basically, I don't cease to make mention of you. I don't cease to give thanks to, thanks to God for you. I don't cease to pray. You can kind of condense all of that into one word, pray. So Paul's saying basically, I pray. You might want to say, I pray all the time. I do not stop praying for you. That's what he's doing. And all the other phrases and sentences can actually uh, describe how and what he is praying for. He's making mention of us, or mention of the church there. Um, of course, in turn, um, us uh, in his prayers. The key word is, in my prayers. So, you know, if you like highlighting or underlining, uh, um, underlining your Bible, do that. You underline the word prayers. Um, highlight the word prayers or do not cease to give thanks so that you know what Paul is doing here. That's the key word. And then having said that, go back up to verse 15. He says, therefore, or for this reason. For what reason? If he says for this reason or therefore, then you have to think about what does it refer to? What reason is he referring to? And that makes us go back to the previous section, verse 3 and all the way to verse 14. Now, verse 3, we, you know, a little bit of flashback there. Paul says, blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the main, main word, in, in main verb in verse 3 and, and all the following verses is that Paul is praising God. He's giving all the blessing and praise to God. So praise be to God, or blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because He chose us, because He has predestined us to adoption, because he has saved us, because he redeemed, our, redeemed us from our sins, and because he has forgiven all our sins. And he has opened this mystery that was hidden before, the mystery of the church, and made this known to us. So for that, we praise God. And even you heard the gospel of his salvation, so we praise God. And you're even sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, so, so we praise God. So we praise God for all these things He has done for us. In fact, He has every spiritual blessing that He has given to us. In verse 3, um, it says, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So we praise God. And therefore, for this reason, I don't stop praying for you. That's what connects the previous text with our text this morning. And in verse 17 and following, tell us what he's praying for. So he's saying, we praise God, we bless God for all that he has done for us, that he saved us, he made us his purchased possession. And for this reason, after or having heard of your faith in the Lord and the love for all the saints, I don't stop praying for you. In fact, um, this is the plan. Because this is so dense, we are going to kind of fly over this text. It's almost like flying over a dense bush and forest. We're going to have a look at the whole region. It's like doing a quick survey. And then once we've flown through or flown, flown over this text, we are going to land and traverse through its dense text and examine the individual parts, and then we will have the full picture. You've got the whole picture from above, and you've got a very detailed picture from on the ground. And we can put them all together. So just doing a quick flyover of, this, of, the, of these texts, we can see this. So in verse 15 and 16, it says, I don't stop praying for you when I hear, or after having heard of your faith and your love for one another. And I am praying for this, basically, in verse 17. I pray that you will, 
you will get the spirit of wisdom, that God may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation of, uh, in the knowledge of Him. So he's saying that, I pray that God will give you wisdom and knowledge. And verse 18 is saying, I want your eyes to open, to be enlightened, so that you can see and know. And I pray that God will reveal the truth, the full knowledge of Him. So he's saying, I want your eyes to open, that God will open your eyes, and I want you to know um, and have the wisdom of Jesus Christ. And the, the things that he wants the church to know are these. First of all, in verse 18, the hope of his calling. The hope of his calling. And secondly, he says, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? So I want you to know about the calling, and I want you to know about your inheritance in him, and thirdly, I want you to know what the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe is. So three things. The calling, inheritance, and the power. And then verse 20 and 21. By the way, by that power, it's a description of the power. By that power, God made Jesus to sit on his throne in the heavenly places, which is far above everything else in this world and in the world to come. Verse 21. So just uh, put it all together and just make it simple and understandable. Paul is praying so that the church in Ephesus would know the calling, the hope of his calling, the rich, glory, glorious inheritance of God, and also the mighty and great power that we have from Him. By the way, that power is so powerful, that power raised Jesus Christ and made Him sit at the throne, on the throne at the heavenly places, which is far above anything else in this world or the world to come. So I hope that that makes some sense. And then verse 22 and 23, he's simply saying, it's a kind of, um, you know, cond condensed summary of all that, and he's saying, hey, look, he put all things under his feet so that Jesus Christ would be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So you've got some order there. So God is now basically putting everything in order. Paul's simply saying, look, God put Jesus as head, and the church is the body, and everything else is below the feet of that body. You see the order? Christ, church, everything else. And now you have everything in proper perspective. And that's how we Christians should see everything. Christ is first and then the church and then everything else. And that ought to, pri that ought to give you the right priority for your life, for planning your life. Christ first and then the church first and then everything else beneath that. So you can see that Jesus um, is everything here. You know, he is now sitting far above on the throne in the heavenly places and he's the source of the power. And now he's the head of the church, the body. And everything else is underneath that. So remember that this is the map. This is like quick flyover of the, of the text. So don't get lost. You know, we will not get lost and we now know the way. So you kind of know the way from here to the city. And now you've got to find out which street and where to turn left and turn right. And you can kind of you know, make your way, even though you might get lost a little bit here and there, you know the sort of overall route, so you know uh, you can get to the destination. So we have the map. Now we are going to get into the actual dense bush. I might lose some of you if you don't follow me closely. So if you're distracted, you'll get lost. So follow me closely and we can get through the dense bush and understand and appreciate even the fruit of each tree that we might come across. Amazing, amazing truth, which will be so powerful once you understand it. Now the text has three sections. We can see, first of all, the reasons for his prayer. We can kind of um, go over that quickly because he's got about one or two verses about that. Um, so he has reasons for prayer. And then the secondly, we have the content of his prayer. 
the calling, the inheritance, and the power. That he wants us to know all these things. So that's the content of the prayer. And then we have in verse 22 and 23 the result of prayer. The right priority, proper perspective. So we have the three sections. And in section 2, we can actually see in the content that there are three sub Headings. So you've got the reason for prayer, you've got the content of prayer, you've got the result of prayer, and in the content of prayer, you've got three, the calling, inheritance, and the power. That works out to be actually almost perfect um, sermon structure, isn't it? I mean, like introduction, the three points in the main body, and the conclusion. So I don't even need to work on that because the text gives me all that. So let's start with the reasons for prayer. Now we've landed and we're now trying to traverse through this dense forest. The reasons for prayer, it's like introduction, you see the beginning. So why is he praying? He says, therefore I also, he says, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. The reason I am praying for you, what prompted me to pray for you, Paul says, is that, that I have seen the faith in the Lord Jesus. Your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. It caused me to burst into spontaneous prayer of thanksgiving. And you can see that the faith in the Lord is saving faith. And that's what Paul said in previous text. You have redemption, forgiveness of sins. God made you purchase possession. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now you're saved and you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And chapter 2 expands even more. He says, by, by grace of God and through your faith, He has saved you. In verse 8 and 9, we will come to that for sure. We have been saved by grace and through faith, and it is not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. So you've got the saving faith. I pray for you because you're saved. When I see your faith in the Lord, it makes me to pray for you, and I don't stop praying for you. That begs the question, then, are we saved? When you pray for the church, you pray for the church because the church is an assembly of saved people. The only prayer we can pray for the unsaved is their salvation. But if you're saved, then your prayer becomes so much richer than that. You pray for salvation for the unsaved, but for the saved, you can pray that God will unlock the treasure trove so that we can see and know the things like the hope of calling and the glorious inheritance and the riches of His grace, his grace and, and inheritance and also that mighty, amazing and abounding power that we have in Jesus Christ. So do we have the saving faith? Do you have the saving faith? When you see that genuine saving faith, then you can pray. You can pray so more powerful prayer. And you can think about that even in your own life. You might have uh, led someone to Christ. Before that person is saved, you pray for that person's salvation. But once that person is saved, then you can see that there are so many things you want that person to know. And therefore, your prayer now becomes so, uh, so great in scope and depth. You pray for that person's understanding to grow. You, you pray for the person's knowledge and faith to continue to grow. You pray for so many things and so many blessings that the person can enjoy. That's why Paul's praying for the church, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And also he saw that the love, um, that they had genuine love for all the saints. Now, as I told you, Ephesian church later, by the time of Revelation, is rebuked for lack of love. But at least here, the church is a very loving church. They began with love. They had, a, had, had great love. And that's why the, the rebuke becomes so much more heavy because Jesus is saying, you left your first love. Where is that love? You've got to go back and find it. You had great love for one another, for all the saints, and you have left that love. But here at least um, they have that love. And Paul says, I have heard of your love for all the saints. Not only one another, just that church, but they also had love for all the saints, for all the churches. In fact, Ephesus, you might remember in, in Acts chapter 16 and all, all the way 
Paul was preaching the gospel and planting churches not only in Ephesus but also in Philippi and Colossae, all the neighboring regions. In other words, Ephesus church was like the head church. It was like the central church from which the ministry went forth to many other places. They had love for all the saints, for all the churches. And Paul knew of that love. When he heard of that love, continuing, by the time Paul's writing this letter, he's away from the church, he's in prison, but he's hearing about the church and how the church is going. And he still hears that they have love for all the saints. And I don't cease to pray for you. I don't cease to give thanks to God for you. So then, let's now think about that. Do you pray and give thanks to God when you see brothers and sisters loving one another? That is a great reason to love. and uh, well, That is a great reason to, to pray to God when you see the love of one another. And when you don't see that, then obviously you can pray that, that you might have that love, like we read um, in Revelation chapter 2. But Paul heard of the prayer, and he was constantly praying for them. I don't cease to make mention of you. I don't cease to make, uh, make prayers for you. I pray for you always. You can see that this would be only possible if you're in constant contact with the church. And Paul always would send people to the church and people would come to him and pass on the news of the church. And if you're not in contact with the church, if you're not in the church or in contact with the church, then you wouldn't know about these things and you wouldn't pray for them. So you can see that Paul was always in constant communication with the church and he was now praying for them. So the reason for prayer is that he hears of their faith and love. Faith and love. Now, by the way, the very familiar triad of faith, hope, and love, they all appear here in this text. That's another sort of side exercise that you might like to do. Many of the texts that contain faith or hope or love somehow contain all the three. Now, here we have faith, we have love, we have hope in verse 18. And of course, that triad appears in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The greatest of them all is love. So let's now have a look at the content of prayer. Content of the prayer that Paul is now offering to God. Now from verse, um, you can see from verse 18 or actually 17, um, he's saying this, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. So first of all, he's praying that God would give you wisdom and knowledge. The spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of Him, or full knowledge of Him. In some translation it says full knowledge of Him. It is a gradual revelation, it is a progressive revelation. Um, we know about Christ, but we don't know about Christ in full yet. So he's uncovering and opening the knowledge of Jesus Christ progressively. And that is also personal. Some person in our church might have this much understanding, some person might have that much understanding, and some might have even greater understanding. So Jesus Christ and the knowledge of Christ is being revealed more and more. And then you can think about, then, then how much do I understand? Of course, in a sense, you have to understand 100%, and that 100% is not so much 100% of the knowledge of Christ, but it is 100% of as much as you can know. If God is revealing this much, then you, you should know this much. If God is revealing more, then you should know this much. And it is going to grow and continue to grow as you put yourself to diligent labor to study the Word of God. But you have to understand as much as you can, and it is revealed and more will be revealed to you the more work you put in. So Paul's prayer is that God would give you wisdom with which you can understand and knowledge of Christ. But knowledge of, of Christ in, in what sense? What, what are the, then the details of that knowledge? So with wisdom, what kind of things should we understand and, and know? Now first of all, as we have seen, it is the hope of his calling. 
Now, just before that, um, verse 18 also he says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So there's a little comma, and then there's a phrase, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So he's saying, I pray that you will have wisdom, God will give you wisdom and knowledge, and God will basically open your eyes. That your eyes will be enlightened. You can even say that this, this is um, illumination of the Holy Spirit. So Paul is praying that you would grow in knowledge with the wisdom of God and that your eyes would be open. Are your eyes open now? I can see that you're all not slumbering. So your eyes are open, but are your spiritual eyes open? We can even put it in this way. Are you teachable? Are you willing to learn? Or are you proud to say, I know all that I need to know? There's always more to know. Even if you're teaching in the church, even if you're preaching in the church like myself, I'm still a student. I still need to know, and we all need to know more and more. So we need to open our eyes. And that's essential, open our eyes. Then that also means that you've got to open your, your mind, and your mind must be sober and alert, free from distraction, things that can cloud your understanding. So Paul's prayer, first of all, begins by, by saying this. Before I tell you, before I pray, before I tell you what I pray for, before I tell you what you need to know, I want you to know and have the wisdom and open your eyes. And then he says, the small headings, first of all, I want you to know this, the hope of his calling. Look at verse 18, the second part. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. What is the hope of his calling? Now, what is this calling? First of all, what is this calling? The calling here is the calling for salvation, what we might call effectual calling. Put a bookmark here and go to Romans chapter, chapter 8. You know this verse, but um, I want you to have a look at it. It's Romans chapter 8. We'll have a look at a couple of places in this chapter. Romans chapter 8. Verse 30. You know that the section begins from verse 28, um, and then he says from verse 29, Whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And verse 30, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. So he called us to salvation. He justified us, and he glorified us in a sense. It's a promise. He called us. And this is the calling the calling for salvation. And since when, from when? We read also, this is from before the foundation of the world, from eternity past. God called us from eternity past for salvation. He called us to salvation. And if you're saved, you responded, you responded to the calling with obedience and faith. It's like, you know, you, you go and call someone. You, you might you know, call someone who's sort of walking in front of you. You might be going somewhere, maybe shopping with your family, and you have to call out to your husband, to your wife, or your even children. You call the name. Sometimes they answer, sometimes they don't. And you call out even louder if they don't answer. And that's not really effectual calling, is it? Sometimes it's effective, sometimes it's not. But God's calling is always effective. God calls out to each one of you to save you, to come to, for you to come to salvation. So, so if you're saved, then you responded in your heart with obedience to that calling. So it's effectual calling for salvation. So remember that. I want you to know that calling, but not only the calling, but the hope of calling. Here he says in Ephesians, going back to the, our text, um, make sure you don't lose Romans 8. Ephesians chapter 1, he says, the hope of his calling. So I want you to know the hope of of his calling. What is then the hope? When you see the word hope in the Bible, it's different from the world's usage of the word hope. Sometimes you say, well, I hope you get this job. I hope that you become successful. I, I hope that you can make it. But that hope is kind of wishful thinking. You may make it, you may not make it, but we hope and we sincerely you know, wish for the best. But the hope in the Bible is usually associated with something that is promised, something that is so certain and sure it will happen, it will take place no matter what. 
Therefore, it becomes something that we look forward to. And we know that without fail, it will come true. Such as hope of heaven. If you're saved, you know you're going to heaven. It's not some wishful thinking that you can go to heaven. You know, it's not like when you say, well, are you saved? Well, I hope so. Are you going to heaven? Well, I hope so. No. The hope of heaven is so sure for us that you are going to heaven. Yes, I am. Yes, I am saved. Yes, I am going to heaven. It is that kind of hope. It's not a wishful thinking. It is sure hope that is anchored in the promise of God and the sealing of the Holy Spirit as we saw in the previous text. So go back up, back to Romans 8. Now Romans 8, now this time verse 24 and 25. See, it says, For we were saved in this hope. You see this word? In this hope. You can see that already that this, this hope, if this hope is not sure, then your salvation is not sure. Therefore, this hope must be secure and sure. Because we know that our salvation is secure in Christ. So we were saved in this hope. Because it says, hope that is seen is not hope. He's talking about, he's differentiating the hope that people have in this, in this world. Hope, hope that is seen, things that are seen in this world, it's not really hope. But why does one still hope for what he sees? Not the things that you see, but things that are unseen, but things that are eternal. But if we hope for what we do not see, verse 25, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We wait with perseverance because we know that it will come. Because it will happen. There's no failure. And therefore we can persevere. And you might not see that straight away. You might not see that even you know, in this side of heaven. But it will come to you. It will be real when you go to heaven. And therefore we can persevere all the way to the end. And therefore Perseverance of the saints, and once you're saved through this genuine saving faith, you never fail. You never lose your salvation. And therefore, your hope is never going to fail. And that's the hope of calling. The hope of His calling. God's calling, that is so sure. So do you see this hope of God's calling? Do you see that? Are your eyes open? Do you see that? Can you see that like fruit of, of that first tree that you come across now in that dense bush? Can you know what this is? Now, this is a really wonderful analogy because it says, I want your eyes to open and see. But I also want you to have the wisdom and to know, have the knowledge that is revealed to you, knowledge of Him. And in order to know, the word know here is intimate knowledge or personal knowledge, seeing is not enough. Let me give you an, just a an very quick example, illustration. You might see a beautiful apple, or, or what, what fruit would be good now? Winter fruit, maybe mandarin, orange, I guess summer fruits are a lot better and sweet. So let's say that, you know, mango, if you like mango. You see a beautiful mango. But how can you know, know the fruit? When you eat that fruit, you've got to eat and taste the fruit to see how good it is. And that's why Psalm in Psalm 34 says, see and, and taste the goodness of the Lord. Seeing is not enough. You, you've got to see that for sure, but you've got to taste and know that. And that's the, the knowledge. The, the word know, knowledge, is to know intimately and personally and experientially. So if you can see the hope of His calling that the hope is so sure and it is so amazing and grand and glorious of, of things of, of heaven, then you've got to taste it and, and know. You, you've got to know that. So do you know what this hope of calling is? Do you know what it means? You might say, how can you taste heaven? You can. Because the kingdom of God, heaven, is... Not here or there, but where? Where? Where is the kingdom of God? In our, In our hearts. Within you. Within you. In the context of church, within the plural you, the church. That's where this is. And that's where you can taste the goodness of heaven. The hope of His calling. You can taste heaven on earth in the church. 
And that will be made full in real heaven. But you can actually know that, even experientially. You can know that from the Bible, from the scripture. You can see and know. So I want your eyes to be open and to know this, the hope of His calling. And this is where your Christian life really begins. And if you're not saved, you don't see that. You don't understand it. You don't know that. All you see is worldly things. And all you see are the temporal and visible things. But as we know in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if that's all that we hold for, then we are the most miserable people in the world. And also he says, all these temporal things that you see are going to pass away. Things that are not seen are the eternal things. But of course, if you're not saved, you don't see these things. You don't know anything about heaven, about the hope of His calling. So as Christians, what do you look forward to? What do you look forward to? What's the next big thing that's going to happen in your life? What's the next thing that you're looking forward to? Is it going out for dinner tonight? Or lunch? Or is it that holiday you're going in a few weeks? Or is it something that you're going to enjoy, your hobby or some purchase? Or going to party? Or is it getting married? Now all these things the unsaved are looking forward to. Now these are temporal things and these are not perfect hope. They can happen, they may not happen. The real hope that anchors our life is the hope of your calling. The calling of Christ. Calling you. What excites you? I mean, actually, what excites you? The worldly things might excite you for a temporal time, and, and just a little bit. But what really excites you? Paul is saying, I pray so that you can see and know these things, so that you look forward to that hope, so that you become so excited about this coming heaven. You're excited about the kingdom of God. That your life is anchored in this hope of His calling. So that's the first thing that Paul is praying for. That we would know that. That our eyes would be enlightened. So that we would have the knowledge and we would have the wisdom with which we can know the hope of His calling. And secondly, the content. If you look at verse 19, 18, let's go back to our text in Ephesians 1. He says, after that, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? It's a little long, but it's not that complicated, is it? I mean, it's talking about inheritance in the saints, but also it is the glory of inheritance, and it is also the riches of that glory. So you can see that, you know, it's like, you know, one modifies another, and then this modifies that. So, yes, it is inheritance, but it is also the glory of, of inheritance, but not only that, but it is the riches of the glory. It's, it's like the hope of calling. It is calling, but also it is the hope of calling. So in order to begin to understand this, we have to look at the inheritance first, because it is talking about the glory of inheritance and then the riches of the glory. I want you to know that. So what is then this inheritance? This inheritance, you might remember from verse um, 11 and 14, we looked at that a few weeks ago. Let's just go back up to verse, verse 11. It says, in him also we have obtained inheritance. It says, it says, we have obtained an inheritance. In other words, we have this inheritance because we are saved. Now verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance? So this inheritance is guaranteed by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of promise, until the redemption of the purchase the possession. So until we actually come to the kingdom of God, full glorification, we have this inheritance that is promised and guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. But what is this inheritance? You might also remember that I um, gave you a little analogy there as well. Um, it's helpful to think about Old Testament inheritance, Israel's inheritance. When Israel went out of Egypt and went through the wilderness and just about to enter into the land of Canaan that God promised, that God was going to give the land as their, their inheritance. Remember that? The tribes, except for the Levites, Levites were not given any inheritance because their, their inheritance was God himself. Um, all the other tribes were given some parcels of land. 
all of the land of Canaan was divided into different portions and given to the families of all these tribes. It's interesting, the land actually belonged to God. So in the ancient Israel, they could not sell or buy land permanently. They could only give the land out on long-term lease, 49-year maximum. Because every 50 years, it will go back to the, right, the original owner. I think that's a wonderful system, but you know, now it's a bit different. But that's how it used to be. So the land was the perpetual or eternal inheritance that they were promised. And that means the lands, uh, which is part of the kingdom, was their inheritance. So inheritance for the Israelites was the land and the kingdom and all that entails. In other words, if you belong to a kingdom, then you are a citizen of the kingdom. And if you're a citizen of a powerful kingdom, then you have certain privileges and certain rights. So all that was their inheritance. And to them, it was visible, tangible things that they can see and touch. Of course, that's a picture of our inheritance. Now, you're saved, and that means you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. So you have all the privileges that comes with being a citizen of the kingdom of God. God's kingdom, God's kingdom citizen, so you have all the privilege. If you're a citizen of a country, Australia or America or any other country, then you have certain rights and privileges that, that you have because you belong to that, that country. Likewise, you belong to the kingdom of God. And therefore, we have or we enjoy the citizenship of the kingdom of God and all the privileges that you are going to enter into the kingdom of God, that's guaranteed. You also enjoy the, the taste of, uh, of heaven in this world, in the, in the church. You also can be um, so um, you know, full of confidence and full, full of knowledge of Christ, and, and you have everything that is available to you that will uh, be necessary for you to live faithful life and fruitful life in this world. Basically, heavenly blessings, every spiritual blessing that Paul mentions in chapter 1, um, verse 4. Every spiritual blessing. That's inheritance by being a citizen of the kingdom of God. So can you now see that? Can you see that inheritance that you have in Christ? Do you know them? Do you know them? Did you know that you have certain rights or certain privileges in Christ? Of course, you have certain you know, obligations, your responsibilities. But of course, the, ben the benefits of um, the kingdom citizen is, is far greater. It outweighs far more than anything else. So can you see that inheritance? And do you know that inheritance? And of course, if not, then you're living for only temporal things. You're living for only earthly things. So first of all, you've got to see the inheritance and know the inheritance. But more importantly, you've got to know the glory of inheritance. Glory of inheritance. What is the glory of your inheritance? Now sometimes people in this world have inheritance. Um, it may be promised. Uh, you, you have very rich parents. Your parents might be multi-billionaire. And if you're a child of a rich parent or parents, then you kind of have promised inheritance. And I guess when they pass away, hopefully, you know, all the inheritance will come to you. So you can even say that, well, I've got so much inheritance, it's like, you know, glorious. Uh, you know, you, you can use that money to, you know, buy lots of things, um, you know, gold and, you know, jewelry and, and a house and, and nice car. You have all these things that you can show off in a sense. And people might say, well, that, that's great. That's wonderful. That's even, you know, glorious. But that's earthly things. They will perish and they will be you know, corrupt and fade away. But imagine this. Glorious kingdom of God. Glorious kingdom of God. How glorious? Now you go and read Revelation 21 and 22. You'll have a little glimpse of how glorious the kingdom of God is. Even one city in the kingdom of God is described in such a wonderful way that your mind will be you know, dazzled and, and overwhelmed. The real example of that can be found strangely and, and quite interestingly in 1 Kings. 1 Kings. 
In 1 Kings, we have the story of Solomon. Now, actually, let's have a look at that. I want you to see this, that expression. It's, it's quite a um, comical expression there. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 5 is, is where we will see. Now, 1 Kings chapter 10. In 1 Kings, um, it begins the story of King Solomon as David goes into glory. And then, um, throughout the, the coming chapters, up to chapter sort of 8, 9, Solomon is building the temple and building the city, his own palace and the temple, um, the city of Jerusalem and all of that. And then verse um, chapter 10, the queen Sheba comes to see Solomon and his wisdom. She brings difficult questions, but nothing so difficult for him. Chapter 10, if you look at verse 3, it says, So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he should not answer or explain it to her. He could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, so even the temple, there was what? No more spirit in her. Can you imagine that? I don't know if um, anyone has experienced that. But I guess, um, um, let's say that maybe the, the ladies, suppose that you walk into the most extravagant jewelry exhibition, like store or exhibition, where you see you know, one gemstone might cost a million dollars or something like that. And you've got not one, but hundreds and thousands of them all on display. It's like literally dazzling. And you don't know where you, put your, you, you can put your eyes on. There are so many things, and you go here and you go there, that your mind is just you know, out of your mind, in a sense. There was no more spirit in her. It was so glorious and so extravagant that she did not know what to say, what to think. She was out of her mind. It's like, I guess, um, you know, this is a little small comparison, but it's like a little kid in, in candy store. You've got so many things that you want, you just don't know what to go after. You want this, you want that, you want that, you want that. Now, that looks good, this looks amazing, this looks beautiful. Now, when Queen Sheba saw that, she was so out of her mind that there was no more spirit left in her. There was no more spirit left in her. And this is what happened when she saw the earthly glory. Earthly glory. Now can you imagine what it would be like when you went to heaven and see that glorious and magnificent kingdom of God? I'm sure we would be like this queen of Sheba. There's no more spirit in us. And some people, someone once said, when we go to heaven, everybody's jaw will drop to the floor, literally. You, know, you go like, and then you just don't know what to say. And all we can do is just praise God eternally, eternally. And that's the kind of glory of your inheritance. It's not some money, whether that's billions of dollars or whatever that money may be. It's not anything material. It's eternal things. It's glorious things. It's immaterial. It's godly and amazing and glorious things that God has in store for us and that is our inheritance that does not fade away as Peter says it is not corruptible and it abides forever he has reserved these for us in heaven so can you see that glory of inheritance do you know that glory of inheritance and the place where you can experience some of that is the church the church so can you see that you can see that look at the phrase again go, go back to Ephesians chapter 1 what are the riches of the glory so you have, you've got the inheritance you've got the glory of inheritance but not only that it is the riches of the glory it is so rich the riches so you can see that it's escalating more and more. He can simply say inheritance. But he's saying, you know, glory of inheritance. 
no, not just the glory, but the riches of the glory. I mean, it's almost as if the Paul is running out of words to use. But you can see that if he had the vocabulary, he can go on forever. He can say like something of this and something of that and something of that and something of that. You just, you just have to go on forever because it's eternal inheritance. And again, he says, his inheritance, where? In the saints. Can you see that? The riches of the glory of inheritance in his saints, in the saints. And who are the saints? Who are the saints? Us. Christians. The church. So where is this inheritance? Um, I mean, not to the full extent, but where can you experience and see and know this inheritance? Or the glory of inheritance? Or the riches of this glory of inheritance? In the saints. The church. So Paul's praying that we would know and see the hope of his calling, the riches of the, gr riches of the glory of inheritance in the saints. And thirdly, he says, I, I now want you to know the power of God. The power of God. Now this is even lengthier than before in verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? The so first of all, what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Now, th th this is almost um, um, incorrect grammatically. I mean, not incorrect, but almost. Why? Because it says, um, it it's almost redundant because he's saying exceeding and greatness. It's kind of saying the same thing. Exceeding and greatness and his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty Power. Can you see that a synonym for power is used here at least four or five times? Greatness, his power, and mighty, and power. Why would he do that? Why, why, would, why would Paul do this? Of course, he wants to emphasize and stress this, and that's why he's using the word that's related to power at least four times here. Four times here. Now we'll see the description of this power, what, what kind of power this is. But first of all, he says, I want you to know his power, but his greatness, its greatness, the greatness of his power. By the way, this is not just great power, this is exceedingly great power toward us who believe. So it's just like inheritance in the saints, he says, this is a power toward us. And just as, you know, almost as if it is not enough, he says, according to, again, the working of his mighty power. So his mighty power is working, and according to the power, I want you to know that power and the greatness, so exceedingly great power, that is toward us who believe. So this is the power that he wants us to see. This is the power of God that... He wants us to know. Now that power is described here. Um, well, actually, before that, th this is a very um, favorite expression for Paul, because in chapter three, just turn to chapter three, verse twenty. At the end, he says, "According to the power that works in us." You see that? According to the power that works in us, he talks about the power of God that works in us, the church. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, he also says, according to strengthening, which is a synonym for power there, um, I can do all things who through him who strengthens me. In Colossians 1, 29, he says the same thing. I, I do and I labor because of the strength that God provides me. So the power is what really energizes us. And it's described here in verse 20, our text, chapter 1 again, and, and the following. Now look at this. He says, the mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. This is the power that caused 
resurrection. Again, this is um, a lame illustration, but when your phone is dead, what do you do? Because the power is gone. And as the phone battery is being charged, what do you see on the screen? Depends on what phone you have. I, I guess you see a logo, or you might see just a light, light up, lighting up of the screen. So the power comes back on. And you can see the power slowly building up on the battery level. That, that's a kind of power, isn't it? It's, it's the power that gives energy. It's the power that runs that device. In fact, if you think about that, everything in this world needs power. The Earth is rotating, orbiting, you know, orbiting and, and rotating on its, on its own axis and orbiting around the sun. It requires power. Where does the power come from? It comes from God. When you wake up in the morning, you need power to get up, get out of your bed. Where does the power come from? It comes from God. When you come to church, you need power. Well, your car needs power too. Where does that come from? It comes from God. God gives all that's necessary to provide that power. Even the fuel, the raw materials all come from God. And even to make that thing, people have to put in the power and effort and energy. Everything requires power. Everything. And the source of all that power is God. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, He upholds all things by the power of His word. He upholds all things, not only creation, but He upholds all things. All things exist because of God's power and His word. In other words, if God lets go and stops supplying His power, then everything will cease to exist. You will not exist. You have your being, you have your breathing, and you have your power because of God. Of course, unbelievers don't know that. They don't acknowledge that, and that's why they don't give thanks to God. But we do, so we thank God. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the power and strength to, to live another day, to live for you, to come to church, to do my work, to support my family. All the things that I do, even the ability to read and to see, the, the fact that I have eyesight and the wisdom and the knowledge that I have, it's all from God. The power comes from God, but that's, in a sense, a common grace. Even non-believers enjoy that. But there is even the power, the great power that is only available to believers. Verse 20, it is the power that raised Jesus from the dead. It is the power that makes the dead live. It is the power that injects life to the lifeless dead people. And so much so, this power is so great that sometimes it actually allows us to do beyond our capacity. It's almost like supernatural strength. Paul said, to the churches in Macedonian region, very poor churches. You're giving so sacrificially, you're giving even beyond your ability. It's because you have given yourselves to God first. And that's the kind of power, the power that enables us, us to do more and beyond what we are even capable of. And this is the power that raised Jesus from the dead, and it's the same power that will raise us from the dead as well. It is the power for our own resurrection. So do you see that power? Do you know that power? You can see that already, that if you understand this power, and if you have the, the sure hope of his calling, and if you also can see the amazing inheritance, that will change the way you live your life. That will change the person's perspective, thinking, philosophy, everything. That it will change everything about your life. Power is what moves everything. If you want to move something, you just lift it and, and then move it. And you need power. You need strength. You need, you need energy to do that. Power changes things. Power moves things. It's like power of a huge machine. I mean, if you have an excavator that lifts a tons of dirt from the ground and breaking into the rocks, it's a, it's a 
really huge power. If you're talking about some you know, drag cars that can sprint from zero to 100, say in you know, one to two seconds, that, that's an amazing power. If you're talking about even earthquakes, we see that in the Old Testament, to just show a little bit about God's power, sometimes he just shakes the mountain a little. And then people tremble and say, oh, we are about to die. The people of Israel said, please, Moses, you go up. We cannot come near because the whole mountain is shaking. God is coming. Oh, we cannot stand. We may die. That's the kind of power, the power that can even shake the whole world even the entire earth. That's the power of God. Just a little glimpse of God's power. And the power of God also, in sort of a um, spiritual sense, changes people. It transforms people. It makes dead people live. It makes living people change. I'm sure that when you hear some amazing testimony, you'll say things like, Oh, that was a powerful testimony. I mean, where's the power? It's not a power like in kilowatt or horsepower. It's not the power that registers on Richter scale for earthquakes, but you say that's a powerful testimony. That's a powerful testimony of God and His transformation in that person's life. And that changes many people's lives. It's the power that moves people from death to life, from hell to heaven. It's the power to, to change people's lives completely. It's the power to change the minds of people. It is the power that smashes the hardened hearts. It is the power that crushes the pride heart of people. It is the power that even sanctifies sin-ridden people like us. It is the power that cleanses us from sins and protects us from sins. It is the power to change our lives to be more godly and to be Christ-like. Can you see that? Where can you see that? The power that works in us, the church. Ephesians 3.20. Where can you see that? Where can you know that? How can you know that? It is the church where you can see and know this power. It is the church where you can experience this power. So do you realize that this power is available at your disposal to you? Did you know that? Did you realize that? Why did that you live some miserable life? Because you don't realize that. If you're a Christian, then the moment you realize this, then your life will be different. The way you, you see things will be different. The way you, you think will be different. And you know that that's where everything begins. The moment you begin to see, you, you begin to see things differently and you begin to perceive these things differently and the moment you uh, you prioritize your life differently, your life changes. And it's all the power of God. It's the power of transformation. It's the power of moving. This is the power that raised Christ from the dead. And not only that, it seated him. Look at verse 19 and uh, 20. He's now seated at his right hand in the heavenly places. It is the power that brings Christ up from the dead and made him to sit at the right hand of God. This is the power to conquer death. I mean, just imagine that. Would it, would it be a, a wonderful thing to have the power? And how powerful would it be if you could bring someone from the dead? And that's more than any power in this world. It's more than any visible power or material power if you can bring someone from the dead to life. But that's the power of God. That's the power of God that also made him to sit at the right hand of God. Now people can only imagine of this. I mean, the doctors would, would um, give anything for that if they can have the power to bring anyone from the dead. If they have the power to heal anyone, they would be over the moon. We know that that's not possible. But that's the power of God. God brought Christ from the dead. And now he also has brought him from the dead and he transcended from this material world into spiritual world and he made him sit at the right hand of God. At the right hand of God. And by the way, that place that Jesus is sitting, look at verse 21. It is far above 
all principality and power and might and dominion. Now, principality simply refers to spiritual beings like angels and demons. Principality and power and might and dominion. In fact, this expression, the, the four words, was a common Jewish term to refer to the spiritual beings in the spiritual world. So if you want to say something is far greater than anything spiritual, anything you know, idolatrous, even anything sort of you know, God-like or anything spiritual, then you say about principalities and power and might and dominion. And he uses this expression in, in other places as well. Jesus is now sitting far above, not just above, but far above. I'm sure that if Paul had choice, some, if, he, if he could, then he would, he would have probably said something like, you know, far, 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 far above. It's like far, far, far away in galaxy. You know, far above all these things, Jesus is sitting in the heavenly places. By the way, let's not forget that it's the power of God that made him sit in that heavenly places, which is far above. When you read the Bible, this is a sort of handy tip. There are a lot of nouns and verbs. And nouns and verbs are real tangible words that actually tell us what's happening and, and what is happening. So it's like, you know, I, I pray, that's a verb, I pray so that you would know and have this knowledge, inheritance, power, calling. Now these are all nouns. So you've got a lot of these in, in this text. Sometimes it's very helpful to pay attention to adverbs and adjectives, like far, it's far, and above, adjectives, not beneath or any other place, but above. Once you understand these um, you know, adverbs and adjectives, it, it just changes your scope of understanding. It goes like from, okay, I understand the inheritance, but it's the glory of inheritance. Oh. But it's not just glory of inheritance, but it is the riches of that glory of inheritance. So you can see it goes more and more and it is revealed more and more. The more you pay attention and work hard at understanding this, looking at every single word in the scripture, it, it just elevates your understanding and it deepens your understanding. It actually makes your width of understanding that much broad. And you can see that you're growing and you're, you're kind of given the re revelation of God's truth more and more. So it is far above, far above anything in this world or out of this world. And that put all things into proper perspective. Christ is so far above. And therefore, look at verse 22. This is the result of the prayer. The result of the prayer is this. A result of all things, you can say. A result of all things is that he put all things under his feet. All things, including even principality, power, might, and dominion, even all the spiritual beings, angels, and demons, and all that, whatnot. All things under his feet. So imagine Jesus Christ, and everything is under his feet. And by the way, Jesus is the head, and the body of Jesus is the church. So he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him. So in this body of Christ... There is fullness of him who Christ fills all in all. Simply to say that everything is here in Christ. Everything is in Christ. And that's why we say that the scripture is sufficient. We don't need anything. You do not need anyone to teach you. But we need scripture. We need the truth from the Lord. And, of course, the scripture, the word of God that became flesh is Jesus Christ himself. So if all things are in him and fullness of him is in the body, that is in the scripture and also the church that is faithful to that scripture. You can say that the teaching is in the scripture. And the embodiment of the teaching and the actual application of the teaching happens in the church, the body of Christ. So you see the principle, you see the manifestation of the principle in the church, and therefore you experience that, you know that, and you can see that. And that brings us to two points here, two points. So you've got the reason for the prayer, you've got the content of prayer, the calling, inheritance, and the power. And then you've got the result of that whole thing, is that Jesus is the head, and we are the church, and everything else is under his 
feet. And that brings us to two points. All this knowledge that Paul is praying that we would have is in the body of Christ. Because there, that's where everything is filled. All this knowledge can be experienced also in the body of Christ, the church, where Christ is the head. And you can see how important church is. Church is not some trivial thing where you can just go and attend for a few weeks and then decide to leave and go some other place. Church is not something that you can go and you know, shop around like you go shopping for a car or even shopping for a house. You understand what really church is? Then you know that you can be committed to church for, for your life. You give all that you have so that you can stay and be in the church and commit to the church and to the body of Christ. A local church is merely a representation of that universe, uh, universal church of God or Christ, the, the body of Christ. But of course, local church is what church is to you because you cannot be part of the universal church unless you become a part of the local church in practice. So the people who say that I am a Christian and I don't go to church, but I'm still you know, keeping my faith and study the Bible and so on, that's a load of lies. Don't listen to that. Don't buy into that then why would Jesus teach about all this church and the body of Christ in the scripture? We just don't understand anything, whether the person is saved or not. That might be the question. Second thing is this. When you understand all these things, you, you have everything in proper perspective. Everything in proper perspective. And that is Christ is everything and he is the head. Second comes the church and then everything else under the feet of Christ. And that ought to be how you should prioritize your life. When you want to prioritize and plan your life and how I spend my time and my money and my energy and everything, you've got to put Christ at the top. And then the body of Christ. And understand that everything else is under the feet. Of course, you know, we, it's not saying that you don't need any, everything else. We need our house, we need our money, we need our job, we need our family. You need to go to school, you need to go and cook and clean and do all these things. You might need to even go and socialize and, and mingle with people well, more for the purpose of evangelism, not just for pure entertainment as Christians. You, you need all of that, but understand that all these things come under the feet of the body. And the church comes first because Christ comes first. And basically, the church, the body becomes the core of your life. Everything else revolves around that. And that's how you can see and taste and know all these things that Paul is praying for. So what is Paul praying for? Paul's praying for the church so that the church would open the eyes, have the wisdom, and have the knowledge, and the knowledge of the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of inheritance and the exceeding greatness of his power so that you have everything in perspective Christ, the church and everything else so I hope that you can go back um, you know, I hope that I have just whet your appetite to go back to this text and read again and again every time you read again you go a little deeper and a little deeper and a little deeper in your understanding of this text. And it'll give you, it'll yield the rich dividends if you do the work of trying to understand what it means. Just to help you have a little bit of anchor, now we've kind of gone through the dense bush very quickly. You can go back and, and traverse through the dense bush a little slowly. But let's try to remember this. The three contents. Can you remember that without looking at the scripture? The hope of his calling. Say that with me. The hope of his calling. The second, the riches of the glory of inheritance in the saints. And the third, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. Now, I didn't try to memorize that. I didn't. Honestly, I didn't. I just read it repeatedly and just, you know, is etched in my mind. And you can do that too. 
You don't need some super memory. God will give you power to memorize if you need to. Just try to memorize these things and they will, you know, again, you know, give you the rich um, benefits and blessings of uh, that text and the understanding of the text. So let's pray. Our Father, we thank you once again for unlocking this amazing riches of your truth. And Lord, it is our dear prayer that we can indeed benefit from this, just as Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus. We know that his prayer is also for us. And we pray for the same, Lord. We pray that we will open our eyes, that our eyes will be enlightened, and we will have the wisdom, um, and we will have the knowledge that is revealed to us so that we would know the calling, the hope of calling, and the riches of the glory of inheritance, and also that we would know the exceeding greatness of the power, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Lord, we exalt you and praise you. You are everything, and you have everything that we need, and we pray that we will completely and, and entirely trust in you and depend on you for our lives. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.